LSD does cause psychosis in the people who don't take it. <laughs> so said Timothy Leary at the height of the 60s after acid had escaped from medical labs and gone wild in the streets. It was as though the counterculture had moved from Kansas to Oz. By 1966, LSD was illegal, tragically shutting down and stigmatizing highly promising medical experiments for decades to come. The experiments ranged from the sublime to the ridiculous. LSD showed such promise in treating alcoholism that Alcoholics Anonymous founder Bill Wilson considered including it in his program. In Britain, the military gave it to soldiers. 50 minutes after taking the drug, radio communication had become impossible, with one soldier climbing a tree to feed the birds. <laughs> the, the troop commander <laughs> finally gave up, admitting he could no longer control his troops or his, himself, whereupon he lapsed into uncontrollable laughter. So much for military use. <laughs> Leading medical researcher Stanislav Grof, who worked with LSD while it was legal in the 50s and 60s in Prague and in Maryland at the US National Institute of Mental Health, says this. The cartography that emerged out of this work was a vast expansion beyond what we currently have in psychiatry and psychology. You can map different layers of the psyche, a kind of chemical archaeology. It opened up a vast domain that we now call transpersonal experiences. The other major discovery was the self-healing potential of the psyche. When you change consciousness, it activates your self-healing potential. The fact that we have such narrow and superficial psychiatry means that we diagnose as psychotic st certain states which potentially could be transformative, healing, even evolutionary. Today, the popular use of psychedelics is as big as it was in the heyday of the 60s. And over the past decade plus, there's been a quiet renaissance of serious medical research. Michael Pollan calls it white coat shamanism. In his new bestseller, How to Change Your Mind, he documents how psychedelics are helping with everything from overcoming addiction and depression to easing the existential t terror of the terminally ill. There couldn't be a more perfect messenger to bring this taboo subject into the light. Michael is level-headed and lucid, a rigorous reporter, a congenital skeptic, a superb translator of science into comprehensible language, and a spellbinding storyteller. But what makes him letter perfect for this mission improbable is that his brand is immersive journalism. In other words, he samples his subject. In doing so, he makes the ineffable effable. As one medical researcher told him, you go deep enough and far enough in consciousness and you will bump into the sacred. In his many groundbreaking and highly influential books and articles, Michael has almost single-handedly shifted the national conversation on issues central to human existence. Our relationship to food with the omnivores dilemma and to cultivar plants with the botany of desire. Now he's done it again. How to Change Your Mind is the authoritative, up-to-date analysis of everything science has learned and all the mysteries yet to be explored. If anyone can open people's minds to this uniquely impressive curative abilities that these substances have demonstrated, it's Michael. Human consciousness is one of the greatest mysteries of existence. As Tom Bissell wrote in the New York Times Book Review, Pollen, has predictably, Pollen predictably does the impossible. He makes losing your mind sound like the sanest thing a person could do. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming the white rabbit of immersive journalism who's losing his mind and proud of it, Michael Pollan. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you, Kenny, for that hilarious introduction. Um, before I start, I just want to say a word about Bioneers. Uh, this is either my fourth or fifth time on this stage, and um, I, the reason I'm here 
one of the reasons I'm here is to express my gratitude to Kenny and Nina for all that this community has contributed to my work. Uh, I was going through the list with Kenny about, about people I met or saw on this stage that became very influential in my own work. I, it was through Kenny I met Joel Salatin, the farmer who's at the center of um, Omnivore's Dilemma. It was through Bioneers that I was first exposed to Paul Stamets, the mycologist, the visionary mycologist, who's very much a part of this book. Uh, Heritage Seeds was an idea that Kenny introduced me to when he was working on that. So I just time after time there has been key moments and I, I have this sense my next book is like somebody out here. I just have to find them. <laughs> so um, this is a, I'm, I'm doing a very personal talk right now uh, and, and it's a talk I haven't done before. Um, and I, so I have to tell you a few things about myself to make sense of it, but I also have to ask a few things of you. So let's begin. Would you close your eyes and raise your hand if you've had a psychedelic experience? Whoa. <laughs> and then raise your hand if you had a ego-dissolving, self-destroying kind of psychedelic experience. Oh, man. Okay, well, many of you could be on this stage with me. Um, uh, many of you have much more experience than I do. Uh, the things I want to tell you about myself in starting is that um, I was a very reluctant psychonaut. Um, I had very little experience. I kind of got into it when I was about to turn 60, which is, I know, not age appropriate. Um, <laughs> and the reasons for that were that I was, uh, I was afraid. I was, I, 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 I was a little late to the 60s party, and, and by the time uh, it kind of swam into my awareness, all you heard were terrifying stories about people jumping out of windows and staring at the sun till they went blind, and scrambled your chromosomes, and all that um, uh, kept me away. And, um, and I just didn't think, I also thought I was psychologically too fragile, I think, that, that, this, that this assault on my psyche I might not be able to withstand. So I kind of, with the exception of a couple low-dose psych uh, psilocybin ex uh, uh, experiments in my late 20s, I really had nothing to do with it. So I, I bring not a long history, but uh, the power of first sight to this subject. Uh, the other thing you need to know about me is that um, I, I never thought of myself as a very spiritual person. In fact, I, I thought of myself as kind of spiritually retarded. Um, and, um, and the most spiritual thing I did really was come to Bioneers once a year. And... <laughs> And I always felt a little bit a fish out of water. Um, I, my perspective has always been that of the philosophical materialist who believes that nature is all that there is and that the laws of nature can explain everything. And so I tended to see spirituality as a contradiction, uh, that, that the opposite of spiritual was material, and I was kind of more on the material side of things. Now, as, you'll, as I'll get to... This was fundamentally a misunderstanding, uh, but uh, I want to tell you how I came to have what I realize now is a powerful spiritual experience on psychedelics and how that experience changed uh, my understanding of what spiritual is. Um, so I got into psychedelics as a journalist. Uh, it was a journalistic quest that gradually evolved, actually very quickly evolved, into a spiritual quest, into a personal quest. Um, and that was, I'd read about these studies that Kenny alluded to of um, terminal cancer patients being given psilocybin, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. I usually have to say that. I don't have to say that in this room. Um, <laughs> but just in case, there's some young people here. Um, <laughs> to help them with their existential terror. Now, to me, when I first heard about it, this seemed like a really bad idea. The last thing I would want if I was facing right up against my mortality was to lose my mind. Um, and uh, and uh, so this was going on. This is not underground work. This was going on at NYU 
and at Johns Hopkins, one of the two of the leading medical institutions in the country. So I, I uh, got an assignment to, uh, to write about it for The New Yorker, and it, it resulted in a piece called The Trip Treatment, which you can read online. And, um, and I started interviewing these cancer patients. The background to this story, which I didn't realize till much later, was that my father had a terminal cancer diagnosis around the same time. He just died in January. And he was in his late 80s, and he never wanted to talk about it. He never wanted to talk about how was he thinking about death? How was he processing this cataclysm? And uh, either he was processing it internally or he was in denial. I never sort of figured it out. So I had this intense curiosity to engage in these conversations with people who were confronting their mortality and were trying to deal with it. Um, and they were the most amazing people and the most amazing conversations. Um, people would have experiences in which they went into their body and confronted their cancer, in which they met God. In, these are high-dose experiences in which they, f they, they felt themselves, uh, their sense of self completely dissolve and followed by emerging into some larger entity. Some of them, I remember, beheld this great plane of consciousness that they understood their own consciousness would join when their bodies died. And they emerged from these experiences, um, about two-thirds of them, all the ones who had powerful mystical experiences, with a completely new understanding of where they were and what was happening to them. Many of them uh, lost their fear of dying. It was the most incredible thing and very hard to, for me to understand from outside. I remember talking, there was one woman I, I interviewed who um, had had ovarian cancer. It was, it was in remission, but she still had this terror of recurrence. This is a woman in her early 60s and a fairly timid woman, figure skating instructor in Manhattan. And she went into her body on her experience and she, and she saw this black mass underneath her rib cage. And she realized that wasn't her cancer because it was in the wrong place. It was her fear. And she did something that her guides, now when you do one of these guided experiences, there are two people with you, a man and a woman the whole time. You're wearing uh, eye shades and listening to music, a playlist on headphones. And all of a sudden she screams at the black mass, although they don't know this, get the fuck out of my body. <laughs> and with that, her fear just poof, disappeared. And I wrote in the article, uh, in the draft, that, and her fear was, uh, you know, substantially diminished, something safe that would get past the New Yorker fact checkers. <laughs> and, but when they called her to read this, uh, and they said, well, he, is it true that your fear was substantially diminished, fear of death? She said, no, he got that wrong. That's completely wrong. My fear was eliminated. <laughs> so these stories... Um, made me intensely curious to understand what this experience was from the inside. I wrote that article not thinking I would ever try psilocybin uh, or have a high dose experience, but I decided I, I now had to. For, for that reason, curiosity, but also it is, as, as, uh, as Kenny said, it's the kind of journalism I do. When I wrote about the cattle industry, I bought a cow. And um, <laughs> so my readers, my readers expect no less. Um, <laughs> But I have to say, I was terrified. Every, there, I had a sleepless night before. I had several guided experiences on several, and unguided experiences on several different uh, medicines. And every night, there would be this ping pong match of, are you crazy? You could have a heart attack. You're going to go to the middle of nowhere with this guy, and is he going to call 911 if something happens? And, and then this other voice was like, aren't you really curious to know what would happen? And, and I realized the first voice was my ego defending itself because it knew what was coming, an assault on it. <laughs> and the problem with your ego is it has command of your rational faculties, so it makes really good arguments <laughs> that are hard to ignore. But in every case, I was able to ignore it. And, um, and but you have to realize, too, when you start late, like, yeah, like I, I had to call my cardiologist before I did this. <laughs> you know, when, you, when you're 60, it's... So, he was cool with everything except MDMA. And he may have been wrong about that. I don't know. Um, so I want to tell you about two of the experiences I had. Um, uh, one, briefly, and, and the, I'm bringing up this one because it really connects to what Monica was talking about earlier, which was... Um, 
as many of you know, I've written a lot about plants, and uh, it's really my first love as a writer and as a gardener. And I've always, and I, in Botany of Desire, I talked about the fact that we're not the only subject in nature, that, that the plants have a point of view too. The subtitle of that book was A Plant's Eye View of the World. Um, but this was an intellectual conceit until I used psychedelics. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so I had a, uh, uh, without a guide, I had a, a fairly high dose experience uh, in my garden and, um, and I had a very strong sense of the plant, of, of that, that consciousness was spread more equally over the natural world than I had ever thought before. And that as I was gazing at these leaves, these leaves were gazing back at me with incredible benign, uh, you know, affect, um, but that everything was much more alive than it had ever been. And so what had been this intellectual conceit became um, this felt truth, this conviction. And I think that's one of the things psychedelics do is that they put flesh on ideas, um, ideas that I already had. So I want to read you a, 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 a brief passage. Um, it's the only thing I'm going to read for reasons of time. From um, what it was like to walk through my garden toward the end of this experience uh, and picture a, a summer day in New England, very hot summer day with lots of things flitting around. My walk back to the house was, I think, the peak of the experience and can't, comes back to me now in the colors and tones of a dream. There was again the sense of pushing my body through a mass of air that had been sweetened by flocks and was teeming, almost frenetic with activity. The dragonflies, big as birds, were now out in force, touching down just long enough to kiss the phlox blossoms and then lift off before madly crisscrossing the garden path. There were more dragonflies than I had ever seen in one place, so many, in fact, that I wasn't completely sure if they were real. Judith, my wife, later confirmed the sighting when I got her to come outside. And as they executed their flight patterns, they left behind them contrails that persisted in the air, or so at least it appeared. Dusk now approaching, the air traffic in the garden had built to a riotous crescendo. The pollinators making their last rounds of the day, the plants still signifying to them with their flowers, me, me, me. In one way, I knew this scene well, the garden coming briefly to life after the heat of a summer day had relented, but never had I felt so integral to it. I was no longer the alienated human observer gazing at the garden from a distance, whether literal or figural, but rather felt part and parcel of all that was transpiring here. So the flowers were addressing me as much as the pollinators, and perhaps because the very air that afternoon was such a felt presence, it was so, so humid, one's usual sense of oneself as a subject observing objects in space um, objects that have been thrown into relief and rendered discreet by the apparent void that surrounds them gave way to a sense of being deep inside and fully implicated in the scene. One more, uh, one more being in relation to the myriad other beings and to the whole. Everything is interaction and reciprocal, uh, wrote Alexander von Humboldt, the great 18th century naturalist. And that felt very much the case. And so for the first time, um, did this, that he also said, I myself am identical with nature. So that was, thank you. That was um, a, a, a very profound experience, and I would describe that as spiritual. Um, and I'll tell you what I mean after I give you this experience, this other one, where I, um, thus emboldened, I went further and much deeper. So I arranged to have a high dose, uh, kind of matching the doses in these NYU and uh, Hopkins studies, 25 milligrams of um, uh, psilocybin, although I had mushrooms and not the, the, uh, the chemical, which has been isolated. I, I was working with a guide uh, somewhere on the East Coast, very experienced, a woman um, uh, who was a, a wonderful guide, and I felt very safe uh, in her space. And that is critically in important if you're willing to have your ego dissolve. Um, you do need to feel safe. And um, the trip didn't start out that well. I'm going to just walk you through this trip and then tell you what I think it means. Um, she put on some, uh, I had a problem with some of the underground guides. She, th this was not a, a, this was obviously an underground illegal experience, not a, um, 
uh, I couldn't get into the trials at Hopkins or NYU because I didn't have a cancer diagnosis and, or any of the other diagnoses they were working with. Um, but th some of the underground guys play music that I didn't really like. Uh, they, they have a weakness for new age music of the 80s variety. And <laughs> she put on this guy named, um, well, I'm not going to give his name. I don't want to embarrass him. But, <laughs> but when I looked him up later on, um, on iTunes, he, uh, he had been thrice nominated in the category of best chill slash groove um, <laughs> music. And, um, and it sounded like electronica to me, and, uh, and it conjured, one of the things that happens on psychedelics is you can see music. And, and I, what I saw was a computer-generated black and white landscape that was not my thing. I don't like video games. It's not the space I wanted to be in. I wanted natural imagery. And, um, and it went on and on and on, and I started to feel kind of claustrophobic. And, and we argued about the music, and I had her change it, but I, got, I was stuck in computer world. And finally, I had to pee, and I took off the eye shades. And what the amazing thing is you can kind of like come back into reality when you need to for a little while. And uh, she kind of helped me get to the bathroom, and I was very careful not to look in the mirror. Um, <laughs> you don't want to do that. I said this to an audience in England of, of very experienced people, and they were like, oh, yes, trip face. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I didn't do that. And, um, and I uh, produced this spectacular crop of diamonds <laughs> and then made my way back to the, to the futon where I was. And Mary asked me if I wanted a, a, a little more, a, a booster dose. And I was in for the whole thing, so I said yes. And then this really weird thing happens, and she's kneeling by, by my side. I'm in this uh, futon, and I look at her, and she's normally kind of Scando, Scandinavian looking with long blonde hair and high cheekbones, and she suddenly had black hair and weathered brown skin, and I knew exactly who she had turned into, Maria Sabina who some of you will know is the, uh, was the Mazatec um, uh, woman from um, uh, Huatla de Jimenez in uh, Mexico who actually gave the first white man from the West psilocybin in the 1950s. So a key figure in the history of psychedelics. And she had turned, and I didn't think I should tell Mary what had happened to her. Um, <laughs> so I took the additional dose and I put on the eye shades again and then the most... Um, Spooky thing happened. Uh, I'm out of computer world now, and I suddenly, and, and the pronouns are going to sound weird, I see myself burst into just this cloud of little post-it notes. Little, <laughs> I'd been blasted to bits. But I was watching the scene. There was another perspective that had opened up, and I watched, and then I looked out, and I had turned, I'd been liquefied. I had turned into paint or butter just kind of coating the landscape. But I was fine with it. This other eye had emerged, was like, that's what happens, you turn into paint. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was the most amazing thing. I didn't have a self, but this other perspective had arisen that um, had this perfect equanimity. Whatever happened is fine. It wasn't exactly me, and I don't know what it was. I'm, Aldous Huxley would say it was the mind at large. It was some kind of universal consciousness. But I realized it was precisely the consciousness that those cancer patients had described to me. The one that made the, the, the death of their bodily selves and their egos bearable. Um, it was, uh, and when that happens, when your self falls apart, if you feel safe, because if you fight this, it's, that's a bad trip. Um, if you feel safe, without the walls of the ego and the self, these channels open up and you feel this powerful sense. What rushes in is your sense of connection um, because there's nothing that, there's, you have no defenses anymore. You are wide open and so you merge, whether it's with nature or other people and you feel this, these channels of love opening up and this sense of fellow feeling with natural things and um, it was, and for me there was a moment where I merged with a piece of music that I had persuaded her to put on, um, this uh, Bach unaccompanied cello uh, 
concerto, which is an amazing, sad piece. I mean, it's all about death. Uh, this is the suite in G minor. And I just became the music. I became the cello. I felt the bow, the friction of the bow going over my skin. It was just this perfect merging. So it was an ecstatic experience. It was, um, and it, it, it taught me a lot. Um, and I think it, I, and, and many people have had this kind of experience, but I want to just give you a sense of what it means and what it's good for. So in one of these guided trips, you come back the next day for an integration session. And I came back, and she asked me what had happened. I told her I'd had this ego dissolution. And she was, uh, she's like, well, that's worth the price of admission, don't you think? And I said, yeah, but it's over. I'm back. My, my ego's back. It's in uniform. It's on patrol. <laughs> my defenses are all back. And she said, well you've had a, a taste of another way to be, of a more open, less defended way to be, and you have that memory, and you can reconnect to it. And I asked her how, and she said through meditation. And that is now how I reconnect to it. I mean, I think it's a very logical outgrowth, because you can't do psychedelics every day. <laughs> it's a really bad idea. I don't recommend it. Um, but you can have that opening that can help you. Now, I want to say something about the larger value of this experience because I think that it has a relevance to our, our situation, our, our social, political, and environmental situation. I, I actually think the psychedelic experience is significant because it, it addresses the two biggest problems we face as a civilization, which I would list as tribalism and the environmental crisis. They're actually very similar. They both involve the objectifying of the other, whether that other is nature or other people, people of different faiths, uh, different races, different um, political views. Um, and what is tribalism it, but a collective version of ego, right? It's defensive, it builds walls, it refuses connection. Um, so here we have a tool that at least for the individual breaks down these ego formations, allows us to have a deep connection with the natural world and focus on our likeness rather than our unlikeness with other people. That seems enormously promising. But how do you how do you prescribe a drug to a whole culture? <laughs> well, put it in the water. The, the model, of course, is fluoride, right? And even that's controversial. <laughs> I don't think that's the answer. I don't think that's the answer. And this was a debate that happened in the 60s. Do you, you know, Timothy Leary said, turn on as many people as you possibly can. And then Aldous Huxley and some of the academics said, no, no, turn on the elite, and this consciousness will filter down. Turn on the leadership. Now you're all going to, oh, I can think of someone we should turn on. <laughs> but I actually don't think that would work. He'd have to want to do it, right? Yeah. But he knows what his superpower is, and it's ego, it's walls, it's, he's not going to give that up. Um, so that's the challenge that faces us. We have a tool that addresses the two biggest problems we face, and it certainly works well in the individual, and perhaps if more individuals could have this experience, but that is a challenge. How do you democratize this loss of ego, right? Temporary loss of ego for, for learning purposes. Um, and here's where my understanding of spirituality changed, and I'll leave you with this. Remember I said, the opposite of spiritual, I always believed, was material. And that those two things were, could not be reconciled. I no longer think that's the case. Everything I experienced can be understood without any resort to the supernatural. Okay, Connection to other people, connection to nature. Scientists tell us we are. We're social beings. We're totally dependent on one another. And we're completely part and parcel of the natural world. We're no different than any other species. It's just our egos intent on objectifying things won't let us see this. So really, I came to understand I, I had it all wrong about spiritual experience. The opposite of spiritual is egotistical. 
And to the extent we can work on that, and we need to work on that to have any spiritual development. So I'll leave you with that thought. How do we take that, that knowledge and democratize it, give it to as many people as possible, and use it to untie this giant knot? So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're very generous. Go have some lunch. I'll see you later.